So the first speaker will be Dr. Luin from Sogang University, and she will talk about can dark energy be dynamical? So Dr. Luin, so you can go ahead. Yes, thank you for your uh, presentation. And uh, uh, today my topic is can dark energy be dynamic? Uh, this work has been accepted by PRD and uh, this work of my co-creator, uh, Owen and Shaheen will also give talk later. Uh, first of all, I will introduce uh, several kinds of dynamic dark energy models and the evolution of dynamic dark energy. Second, I will introduce some non-parametric dynamic dark energy math, that is uh, Wiggles. Last, I will give the summary. Uh, for what is dynamic dark energy in general? Uh, if we, uh, in general, it means the energy density of dark energy uh, will revolution with the redshift Z. If you read Planck's paper, it will give you one example of dynamic dark energy, dark energy that is CPL. In the CPL, uh, the equation of state of dark energy, uh, this equation, it, we can see it is uh, running with time. Uh, this paper is Planck's 2018's results. Uh, we can see uh, the WA result is almost uh, smaller than zero, right? If the WA is equal to zero, this equation of state will be a constant number. It will not running with time anymore. So a very important feature for the dynamic dark energy is the WA could not equal to zero. We rewrite the equation of state like this. Uh, so. In the next, I will introduce several kinds of uh, models of dynamic dark energy. Uh, this is the equation of state, and this is the ratio of uh, dark energy uh, running with time. We consider this as xz. And the CPL model, the most simplest dark, uh, dynamic dark energy, uh, can be written as this, wz and the xz incorporated to this. Uh, in this work, we also considered another uh, four, four kinds of dynamic energy. That is redshift model, CPL model, uh, Eustachio model, JP, JBP model, and the BA model. We can see the first two model. Uh, this part can be considered as the first term in the Taylor expansion. And for the other model, uh, this term can be considered uh, the second or later terms in the Taylor expansion. Uh, now we show the evolution of uh, uh, dynamic dark energy. Uh, this Wz minus W0 over Wa, we can see uh, this one as the uh, Fz function. So that is the evolution of Fz and the uh, redshift Z. One interesting result is this B model. In the very low redshift, uh, this B model, uh, the, the, the FZ in B model increased very quickly, uh, more quickly than the only redshift one. And but for a little higher uh, redshift, this B model uh, is almost uh, equal to a constant number one. We can see here. In uh, the high redshift, this term is almost equal to one. So that is a very interesting part for uh, the, this uh, BA model. Uh, in the next, we will use the mock data to fit this kind of dynamic dark energy. That is, we use magic to defeat magic. Uh, we mock the DESI data up on a particular uh, dynamic dark energy, dark energy model and then fit the same model uh, to this data to recover the cosmological parameters. Uh, that's we show the result here. Uh, the, this result, the WA is very interesting. Uh, we can see with a little higher different uh, uh, redshift Z max, the error bar the story. Mm. Uh, the error bar in the uh, WA is more and more smaller. In every kind of uh, dynamic dark energy model that have the same result, the higher uh, uh, Z max, the lower error bar for the WA. Mm. This 
can be also seen in this figure. This is the uh, error bar of WA. And uh, for example, we see the CPL. And uh, this one is uh, the, sorry, this one is uh, 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 error in the, in, in Zmax equal to one. And uh, this second part is Zmax equal to two. And uh, the green one is uh, Zmax equal to 3.5. So uh, it is a very interesting thing is this kind of stack energy models uh, also depends, the results also depend on the redshift Zmax. So it's not only a uh, free this result can not only be fitted very well by the observational data or the mock data, but uh, we should note all the Planck GES uh, Euclid uh, uh, observations are all use the CPL model as a very standard stack energy model and uh, consider it very well. Uh, that is the first conclusion. The sensitivity of dynamic dark energy depends on the function uh, multiplying the parameter WA in the usual uh, two-parameter approach W0 and WA. Second, I will introduce a kind of way uh, with non-parametric uh, uh, equation of state, that is Wiggles. In the lambda CDM, we can see the equation of state WDE is a constant number and equal to minus one. But for the uh, for this kind of uh, Wiggles model, this WZ is not only uh, running with time, but it also changing with different red shapes. Uh, that is very special, and uh, this work has been published in the Nature Astronomy, a uh, very important uh, uh, work. Let me give an example for the uh, lambda CDM. It's always a constant number in the uh, all history of universe. But uh, if we consider a uh, Wiggles kind of equation of states, uh, it's always running uh, with the redshift Z. Okay, this kind of uh, equation of state is uh, Wiggles. Mm, now we consider a very uh, important relationship of the uh, WD in different series. If we consider the lambda CDM model, uh, the equation of state is only a constant number. But if we consider a condenses like uh, dark energy model, this uh, WD will always smaller than one or uh, larger than minus, smaller than minus one or larger than minus one. Uh, this kind of theory is uh, all, always based on the field theory, but this Wiggles results uh, uh, have very good uh, fit with the phenomena, but it's out of range of the field theory. So there, I also have a question to the audience. Can the field, uh, can the field theory give a uh, Wiggles equation of state? Uh, we do the simulation uh, based on the Wiggles model. And this is a constraint result for the H0. Uh, the H0 equal to 70.3 and have very small error bar. This is a very good result for the H0 tension. And uh, this result is also uh, same with uh, this kind of figure, this parameter is totally same with uh, this one. This one in also in uh, Yuting Wang and Gongbo's paper. Uh, here I give the um, uh, this this kind of vehicles also depend on some calculation, and uh, if uh, we consider the parameter AC equal to one or the sigma m equal to zero, this kind of XC will also becomes constant. So this kind of vehicles, this kind of interesting vehicles, is also depend on the uh, several parameters. Yeah, so five minutes. Okay, 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 thank you. Mm. 
because we want to ignore the W0 and the WA in the dynamic dark energy, so we uh, introduce the Wiggles. But the Wiggles is also depend on several parameters. It means if we uh, consider if we want to consider something uh, without free parameter, um, if we want to avoid some parameter in the uh, dark energy, it always uh, appears some part um, uh, have some parameter depend on the given by hand. So it is very interesting for is this. We will also back to Lambda CDM again. Oh, so that is the summary of my talk. The sensitivity of dynamic dark energy depends on the function uh, multiplying the parameter WA in the usual two-parameter approach. And the wiggles use a non-parametric mass to build the uh, equation of state, but it still depends on parameters. The last one is a new field theory or structure of universe are still needed to explain the uh, the phenomena of vehicles. That's all I want to talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ryun. So uh, we have plenty of time for uh, the Q and A and discussions. So uh, if you have uh, questions or comments, then please leave it into the Q and A part. Q and A. Yes, but well, you have the Q and A with the sections. Uh, can yeah. I stop sharing? Yes. Uh, if anyone has the questions or comments, yeah. Oh, that's great. I have explained very clearly. So can I just, can we just wait or could somebody but, uh, raise the questions? No problem. Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, so Owen will get uh, some comments. So uh, uh, I have a one, actually uh, two questions. So uh, the well, first one is the, uh, the when you show the uh, the, the measurement with the mock desi data, and mm -hmm. probably you have used the uh, the, the BAO scales. And those scales has uh, some of the error bars. So uh, the, where did you get the error bars so from the, which kind of measurement or did you just use the, uh, the, the, the error bar that uh, the mock desi team claimed or? Mm. Um, we use this uh, mock data based on uh, present, uh, present BO uh, data set and um, we consider the uh, error bar uh, based on uh, thesis. Um, this thesis also uh, have some mock data itself, but we uh, rebuilt it again, use our way and use our uh, red shapes we need. It. So you measure the, the, the BAO scale from the simulation, but, but with your own way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So Sung we got them for the, the percentage errors are in the, the white paper from 2016, right? So we okay. use those. Okay, uh, that makes clear. And second question is the, uh, the each, so you showed that each redshift bin has different prediction power to uh, W0 and omega zero and omega A. Yes. But usually people will try to combine those three different results from the three different redshift bins. Then, if you combine those three, then but are the results consistent with the assumed models, or is if there is some systematic difference? Uh, yes, but if we combine them together, we will uh, we will never see something special, and we will never see the evolution of this kind of model. So we select a different uh, redshift max in our uh, simulation. Uh, so yeah, yeah, we want to see the evolution. We want to see the difference for uh, all these kind of models. Okay. So 
Okay, so that, that is the end of my question. So uh, for two participants, for the, if you have questions, then please leave it to the Q&A or you can raise your hand. Uh, if not, then let's sing uh, to the speaker again. And the uh, next speaker is the uh, Dr. Shahi Sheikh Jabari from IPM Tehran. And he will talk about the, uh, uh, the title is the, the running Hubble tension. So, um, share my screen. Okay, so. Yes, perfect. Uh, can, can you see the slides and yes. do they move? Okay, yes. great. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you very much for the, giving me the opportunity to talk, uh, talk in this wonderful conference. Uh, I'm going to tell you about uh, basically the Hubble tension and uh, it try to present a fresh view on this. This is based on my uh, recent work, which we published in last November in collaboration with Shetan Krishnan on Okulgain and Tao Yang. So uh, this is the outline. And let me uh, first start with a very brief review of FRW cosmology and what, what's now known as standard model cosmology. And basically uh, through this, I state uh, the, what's now called the Hubble tension, the uh, standard uh, statement of it. But then uh, basically I'll try to, uh, uh, provide the fresh uh, framework to think about this Hubble tension. And I introduced the running H0. And uh, basically I'll uh, end with summary and outlook, uh, outlook for what could be a possible resolution for the Hubble tension. That will connect to the next talk of uh, which will be by all. Okay, so uh, as you all know, uh, FRW cosmology is based on the uh, cosmological principle, which assumes homogeneity and isotropy at cosmological scales. This, uh, this is basically, uh, we assume that the background cosmology is uh, homogeneous and isotropic at uh, redshifts above 0.1 or so, or few, few hundred megaparsec distances. And uh, the metric for the FRW background is governed by, in the co-moving frame, is governed by this uh, form. Uh, basically, it has the scale factor, which is uh, depending on the time, co-moving time t, and k is the curvature of the constant time slices. <clears throat> so this metric has only one function in it. <clears throat> Instead of uh, the scale factor, we usually think about the Hubble expansion rate, which is the logarithmic derivative of the uh, scale factor. And instead of the scale factor, we usually, or the time, we typically use the redshift, which is basically standard equations, as you can see. In terms of this, uh, the metric would be written in this form, which up to a, a conformal factor. This is basically completely determined through H of Z. And the goal is basically to read H of Z through uh, cosmology, fitting this uh, background to the cosmological data. Okay, and so uh, the way we usually do it is basically we assume some specific functional forms for H of Z as a function of redshift, and then uh, basically read this, uh, the coefficients of this expansion uh, through data. Uh, in practice, what uh, we do is basically we start with the uh, Friedman equations, which are basically the Einstein's equations written uh, for that specific background. Uh, which relates the uh, Hubble expansion rate to the energy budget of the universe and the e energy budget of each and every component in the cosmic fluid is related uh, given by the is governed by the continuity equation. One can solve this equation once we have the equations of state and then basically put it uh, back and read the uh, z dependence of h. Uh, some typical equations of state, which uh, it was also mentioned in the previous talk, is basically the matter with. It, omega equal to zero, uh, radiation uh, omega equals a third, and the cosmological constant omega minus one, and the curvature, which could be effectively viewed as a matter component with equation of state minus a third. And uh, if W, the equation of state is a constant, one can basically solve uh, the functional form of rho of z uh, in this very simple power law form. And uh, 
if W has uh, the equation of state have, have some Z dependence, it will have more complicated functional form, but it is uh, uh, basically the form of row of Z is known. So for example, we saw uh, some examples of dynamical dark energy in the previous talk. So putting all this all together, what we find is that HFZ up to you know, an overall scale H0 is related to the uh, basically the matter content of the uh, model uh, where the E of Z has no scale in it. It has some uh, um, dimensionless parameters and parameters of the model. So basically to summarize uh, this part, uh, uh, what I mean by cosmological model is basically it's, uh, it is specified by giving uh, this uh, curvature and omega i and then we have three parameters, which are H0 and omega i, n number of them. And we find these values by fitting into the data. Okay. Uh, and within the set of flat uh, lambda CDM cosmology comes with k equal to zero. Uh, it has two uh, matter components, om omega equal to zero and omega equal to minus one for dark energy. And this is the functional form of the H of Z. And, uh, the two independent parameters uh, are specified by the observations. Uh, okay. And the standard model of cosmology is when <clears throat> basically the values of these two parameters are given by these two uh, values written here, H0 as determined by Planck team um, based on cosmological data in particular CMB, which is about <clears throat> 67.4. <clears throat> which is uh, determined by better than person uh, level precision and omega M0, the uh, matter density, which is determined by uh, about 2% precision. So this is about the light and late time cosmology. And uh, if we also include the radiation and the early uh, pre-CMB cosmology, that's the basically a uh, summary of uh, the standard model of cosmology. It has <clears throat> dark matter, dark energy, radiation, and matter with this specific uh, values. And so now what's the Hubble tension? <clears throat> well, as I mentioned, we can reconstruct H of Z uh, once we have the cosmological data uh, in within some given uh, chosen cosmological model. And then from this reconstructed H of Z, we can extrapolate this to H Z equal to zero and read H, H zero. On the other hand, within FRW cosmology framework, we can also directly measure H0. Uh, namely, we can basically uh, 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 do a failure expansion in around Z equal to zero. And the coefficients of the, this Taylor expansion up to this order is basically determining the Hubble expansion rate uh, today and the acceleration Q. According to the Schultz collaboration, reset all, <clears throat> the value of H0 is around 74 and Q is positive uh, around 0.55 with about 15 to 10% precision. So uh, within flat lambda CDM, now we have two expansions, low redshift expansions for the H of Z. The first one is a coming from a specific cosmology model. And the, the right-hand side is coming from the uh, Taylor expansion, which is independent of uh, cosmological uh, model. But the H zeros which are appearing here are uh, basically uh, the same quantities while they appear in two different setups. And again, let me emphasize that this equation only makes sense if we are within FRW framework, both the local measurements and the cosmological determinations. Okay, so now we have two ways to basically determine these cosmological parameters, H0 and omega m from uh, one side. And from, on the other side, we have H0 and Q. And basically through this equation, we can uh, compare these two. And if they don't match, we have some tension um, for uh, cosmological model, basically. Okay, so uh, as usually stated, Hubble tension or uh, basically the two, uh, the two different values for the H0 that we can obtain uh, is uh, from the Schultz collaboration, 74. And for the Planck collaboration, that's about 67 within flat lambda CDM. 
So this is basically a mismatch between uh, cosmological determination of H0 and uh, local direct measurement. Uh, the precision for, so one can also uh, basically compare the values of omega, m, and q, but the, since the precision for q is not so great, uh, that doesn't lead to any specific tension. But these two values, which come both at, with person level precision, and they differ by about 10%, it uh, clearly shows some tension, which is about four to five sigma, depending on how you, uh, what are the uh, basically uh, the measurement that you're looking at. It could be shoes or other ones, or uh, it could be uh, plank collaboration within flat on the CDM or different models with different data sets. So this is basically to summarize the uh, status of this uh, local versus cosmological determination of H0. This is taken from this paper of last March. Uh, typically, what we can see, uh, irrespective of the details, for the cosmological determinations, uh, we get uh, something which is below 70 line, around uh, centered around 67, 68, very close to Planck. And the direct measurements from various different uh, calibrations and uh, measurements, uh, they are centered around 72, 73 with different error bars, of course. So as you can see, there's a clear mismatch uh, with varying different uh, sigma level uh, discrepancies depending on the measurement. Okay. So uh, in view of this, uh, one should scrutinize uh, both sides of the de determinations and measurements. For example, it could be for the systematics for various different calibrations used in local determinations. It could be for some unaccounted for physics and so on. So th this is basically what many people have been involved in checking uh, in the last two, three years. And uh, apparently uh, this is uh, basically, uh, we are dealing with a real tension, meaning that it's not due to <laughs> calibrations or unaccounted for physics. And uh, presumably it's of cosmological origin. So that's basically where the community is sort of standing now. Of course, the scrutinies are still continuing. So uh, within the cosmological side, many people have tried to play with uh, Lambda CDM. Basically, the, it, typically it is viewed that this Hubble tension is showing a problem with Lambda CDM and it's basically pointing us to something out of Lambda CDM. So that's the general uh, current viewpoint. And, you, have five, uh, you have five minutes. OK. okay. So uh, basically, people have tried to play with <clears throat> various dark energy sectors and uh, early or late and so on. But uh, including the BAO and supernova, uh, it appears that it's very hard to get anything uh, uh, H0 beyond 71 within either of these, uh, basically, dark energy sectors. So let me now come uh, to a fresh viewpoint on the Hubble tension. So basically, uh, we are trying to ask, what if the Hubble tension is telling us something not only uh, beyond uh, Lambda CDM, but uh, maybe beyond FR, FRW? So basically, uh, given that many people have tried whatever they could with dark energy sectors and so on, uh, and uh, it's very hard to get within cosmologies anything beyond 71, we basically try to uh, study implications of going beyond FRW. But going beyond FRW uh, brings in too many parameters, uh, just dealing with too many quote unquote scale factors. So we need to be very careful with this and try to uh, formulate the problem in the right way. Uh, so this is the topic of uh, the next talk. But what I'll try to do now is basically to uh, uh, try to give you a minimal uh, implication of uh, FRW cosmology. So uh, within FRW cosmology and Einstein equations, let's uh, have a fresh view on the Friedman equations. Basically, this is the Friedman equations. Now I'm uh, suppressing the, all the details of the equations of state into this W effective, because that would be not so relevant for um, this viewpoint that I'm going to present. One can integrate these equations and basically arrive at this. So it, this equation is written in a very suggestive way in the sense that the H of Z, which is um, uh, coming from uh, observations is uh, 
upstairs and the decades of the model equations of state and so on is coming uh, downstairs and the ratio of these two uh, z dependent functions h of z and e of z uh, it ought to be a constant within frw so the fact that the left hand side is a constant is a direct consequence of frw so uh, basically the, the one can basically uh, reconstruct h of z from data and uh, pick your uh, favorite model and do the and find the e of z and basically check whether this uh, left hand side could be uh, made a constant there is another real point uh, which one can also write the equation in another suggested form let's suppose that we have two models a and b uh, each of them is coming with a value of h0 and a value of e of z and the ratio of these two e of z is basically an integral from zero to z over some function of z and the only way that the left hand side could be a function uh, constant is that uh, this integrand is zero because that should happen for each and every z. So, and that means that the two different models might out, out to be identical. So, if the, the two models are not identical, uh, the left hand side should run within uh, LAM, uh, FRW framework. So uh, that's basically what we mean by running H0. So typically within FRW, we expect that the left-hand side must run. And if we don't see any running, that, that's basically this left-hand side is a constant, either the two models are uh, identical or FRW framework should be broken. So this is basically the message. So uh, this is just an illustrative uh, way of doing this so we can basically take the first interpretation read the h of z and from the data and reconstruct this uh, denominator from the mcmc chains of tank and uh, check whether the left hand side is a constant so this is basically how what we have done with cosmic chronometer data and bao data that's reconstructed h of z and this is basically our diagnostic and in the maximum deviation it shows a 2.5 sigma deviation from what we uh, expect uh, within FRW cosmology. So uh, we don't have an evidence, uh, a strong evidence for uh, breakdown of uh, FRW with this current data. That's what it means. So let me uh, just summarize. Uh, within the concordance model, uh, standard model of cosmology, we, the, all the observed universe is described by six parameters. Two of them are describing uh, the background H0 and omega m. And there are different ways of uh, determining uh, values of HC in particular from the local measurements uh, or from cosmological models. And uh, typically the cosmological one uh, is uh, has a lower value below 70. The local measurements have a value above 70. And uh, many different trials for addressing this uh, discrepancy has failed within FRW cosmology. Uh, and we seem to be pushed to think about uh, out of FRW to uh, be able to address the discrepancy that I just mentioned, the Hubble tension. So uh, uh, this is the topic of the next talk, uh, in particular, how one can trace uh, possible breakdown of FRW within the current data that we have. Okay, so I uh, leave you with the next talk and I'll take questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So uh, this we have we have two minutes of the Q and A session, and uh, Dr. Jajun Jang already gave the questions. The uh, the result shows quite similar features as Zhao et al. reconstruction work. Any reason for that? Uh, well, I I think that this is also related to the previous talk, uh, as I understand it, uh, and uh, basically. Uh, we take similar data, but uh, so I think you mean this part, right? Uh, so we take similar data, but of course we use uh, a different way to analyze it. And I would stress that uh, the features that, as I all, uh, as was also mentioned in the previous talk by Lou, uh, that uh, the vehicles that uh, is um, reported in these dynamical dark energy papers very much depends on how one analyzes the data, whether we impose some specific uh, two point function for uh, densities and so on. So uh, I would say that uh, uh, basically here uh, we have taken 
<clears throat> if you want to know about the details of this, you can look at our paper. But we have taken uh, this left plot is coming from uh, uh, the BAO data is taken. Uh, sorry, the yeah the, the BAO data is uh, taken from the DESI uh, forecasts. Uh, so that's basically where we uh, have taken this data from, and we have uh, tried to fit this within some specific form of HFZ. So um, standard thing. But if you want the details, we can discuss later. So but, uh, to summarize, I think any uh, the uh, dynamical dark energy uh, features should be taken with a grain of salt, as was discussed in the previous uh, seminar. So Dr. Jia Junjiang, so if we're, yeah, I hope that this with, uh, with the answer. So if you have more questions, then probably you can use the Q&A or chat room. Is there any other questions or comments? Probably we have one or two minutes. Uh, if not, I have one question. So uh, uh, when, whenever uh, the people will talk about uh, this, this kind of tension is the early universe and late universe tension. So uh, <laughs> one thing that I'm, makes me worry a little bit is that uh, the, there is a lot of late time uh, H zero measurement, and most of them are what the uh, prefers was seventy two or something like that. But what some of the observation is not. For example, if you go to TRGB observation, mm -hmm. then uh, it seems like was well, something in between the CMB and the supernovae. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, do you want to uh, add some comments to this kind of stuff? Okay, so. Uh as I mentioned, uh, people are doing these uh, checks and basically that, that's something that one should always do to check the calibrations. But uh, while with the TRGB that you mentioned, uh, again, TRGB itself has some varied values, even the mean value. Uh, so now the, uh, I, I think the mean value is above 70, 71. So uh, this yet, to be settled, I think. So th these people should, the TRGB calibration should go on and measure this, but it's, let me emphasize, it's not just between shoes and plank. There are, as you can see, many different uh, measurements with different systematics, different methods. And uh, this is common one. The common two is whether, uh, as I mentioned, it's, uh, local versus cosmological, whether uh, this is uh, related to early physics or uh, late physics could be still uh, a different issue. For example, BAO is mainly coming from, uh, it's a late time, uh, meaning around a redshift below one or so uh, uh, measurement, but it's coming from early physics. So one should discriminate between the physics and the measurement ratio. So they are not uh, for, uh, necessarily directly correlated. For example, supernova is low redshift physics and low redshift measurement. BAO is different. So that's another comment. Okay, so uh, uh, does anyone have the short questions or short comments? Uh... If not, then let's go to the uh, next speaker. Well, let's thank uh, the Dr. Shahin again. Mm -hmm. So thank next you. speaker is the uh, Dr. Owen Corgain from Sovang University, and he will give a talk about the accompanying resolution to A0 tension. Okay, let me see. So you can see this, right? Can I go and try and go like big screen again, full screen? Uh, no, 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 no. You, I think that this will be better. Okay, okay, probably, let's, let, probably let me just start. You can, probably you can just wipe out you at the right hand side. Uh, let's yeah. see. Maybe. Okay, we can, good. Perfect. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for this opportunity to give this talk. Uh, it's in essence a big, big result that has uh, lost me a lot of sleep if you essentially extrapolate it going forward. So let me get straight into it. I should mention, yeah, you can just email me if you want data or if you want to know how data analysis is done. So either my surname at Gmail or own at Sogan will work. And this is based on work with Chetan, Roya, uh, Shaheen and Lou. So yeah, as Shaheen pointed out, this is more or less the status of Hubble tension. Um, so yeah, you could dig into you know, various uh, observations but, it, but it, it's essentially, as I asked Sylvia in her talk, like, so basically, why are these, I mean, okay, this is more or less consistent with Planck, 
Uh, why are these guys offset by these guys by what looks like, let's say, five kilometers per second per megaparsec or something like that? So it seems like all the local determinations are high. And, and if you bear in mind that cosmology essentially progresses through assumptions, at some point, if you work on assumptions, you meet contradictions. Now, the question for the community is, is this all just systematics in, in all of these observables, or is there a contradiction going on here? And we feel there's a contradiction. So now what I should point out is you can read this big long review. It's got 800 references. And this uh, picture is from that review. But very few of these solutions to Hubble tension within FLRW, most of them are within FLRW, are compelling. So some of them modify GR. And we have no observational evidence for modifications of GR. And if I was going to you know, get into modified gravity, I would certainly wait on LIGO. Now, beyond that, I think the next best game in town, or probably the front, you know, the front running idea, and it's been so for a number of years, is, is something called early dark energy. And what it does is it changes the sound horizon. But over the last year, what we've seen is basically there is a cost for changing the sound horizon. And typically in the simplest models, if you alleviate Hubble tension, so the discrepancy in the Hubble constant, then you seem to uh, exacerbate the tension in cosmic shear, right? So, so it's very difficult to do both of these things at the same time. And, and actually, I did attend like talks on Tuesday, and there was a nice talk by Ling Fen Li. And, and he was basically using a whole load of different motivations. So he was using cosmic birefringent, SH tension, even lithium-7 tension from BBN and H0 tension and trying to build a model that could basically do all of these things. So I think now as HEP PH people come into the, come into the problem, you're, you're seeing like people who are basically pulling stuff across a whole load of different motivations. And it's very interesting. Um, and the key point here is we, you know, I mean, EDE, all it does is basically change the the, the BAO scale and the supernovae scale. So basically they line up. It, it, I mean, it, it's essentially one motivation. That's, that's all it is, right? And even if it works and it, it's not really, the simplest minimal model is not working. Okay, so as Shaheen touched upon, FLRW cosmologies have limitations. So we wrote a paper in May. So I, I spent some of springs thinking about this and we gave an upper bound on H0. So basically, these were the assumptions that gravity is described by general relativity. So I'm, I'm not going to do modified gravity. We took the age of the universe from globular clusters. So there was a recent determination by Bernal et al., Vichia Verde, um, uh, Raul Jimenez, various collaborators, um, which is more or less consistent with Planck, uh, with larger error bars, of course. Um, so we assume that Planck have accurately determined omega m h squared. So, I mean, basically, yeah, we're not pulling in lots of Planck data. We're not worried about the systematics. Sylvia spent eight years of her life doing this. But what we are doing is basically just taking this one particular value and we're subtracting out the low multiples. And if you go back to this nice paper from 2010, which is Ruth Durer and her collaborators, they will basically tell you if you take away like the multiples below like 30 or 40, you will be basically analyzing the CMB in its most model independent way. So you're sort of, in some sense, decoupling the dark energy sector or making it as model agnostic as possible. Now, one thing I have probably haven't mentioned is that if you do impose this age of the universe stuff, uh, well, or this constraint, age of the universe is not sensitive to radiation. It's not sensitive to the early universe. Uh, it basically is sensitive to dark energy and matter, and that's about it. So basically, we only had to assume a matter sector, and of course we exist, so it's an okay assumption, and a variable, variable dark energy sector. Uh, we took basically for our supernovae, or at least to model the Reese results of the Cepheids, like Cepheids plus supernovae give you slightly high value. We took this prior on MB from a statue, and then we used more or less very standard data, uh, and this was our result. So we found that the maximum value you could get was H0 is 71 plus or minus one, kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now, if we go back to this, uh, if you look down here, Eleonora has some sort of optimistic average, which is 73, essentially. And then, well, plus or minus 0 0.75 and 72.7 plus or minus 1.1. So we're essentially looking at a, a number about 73. And of course, this is fine because, you know, plus or minus one is within, you know, two sigma. So there's no reason to panic here. Um, but basically, if you want to work within FLRW and you want to get 73 on the nose, you're going to have to find something that works and doesn't make other tensions worse. The other thing to point out is that if you just go for a late universe resolution, so if you don't change the early universe, which means the sound horizon is essentially fixed by Planck, then you, then you still have a problem. So you're in excess of, I think once the results are combined, 
local determinations are combined in some conservative way, you're over three sigma. So there's no way you can resolve Hubble tension doing this. And, and what's nice about this is basically this, I expect this to cover all early universe uh, resolutions. Okay, so I, I'm now going to jump to, now that I've explained what the limitations are of working within FLRW. I mean, of course, it still works, sort of. And um, now let me bring in like this discrepancy that I've only been following since Subir Sarkar has been talking about uh, his quasar dipole. And, and it's very interesting. So basically over the last decade, or maybe even further, the last two decades, people have been trying to um, see whether or not we can recover the CMB dipole. So we, we know that basically, you know, the earth is moving around the sun, the sun's moving around the Milky Way and the Milky Way is in the local group and that's moving somewhere, you know, towards like Shapley supercluster or something like that. So everything's in motion. So basically the standard interpretation for the dipole in the CMB that it's purely due to our motion, right? So you should be able to check that. So you should be able to basically look at some distant observables, say radio galaxies or quasars and basically see that the dipole, or at least the, you know, the motion, our motion with respect to those distant uh, objects essentially agrees with the, the motion we see with respect to the CMB. Now, what I'm gonna tell you is, and this is a beautiful paper here by Dominic Schwartz, which more or less summarizes a whole lot of earlier work, is that what they do find is they do find that the direction is more or less the same direction as the CMB dipole, but the magnitude differs. And in some of these earlier papers, it's sort of like a two sigma discrepancy, and what recently what Subir and collaborators have done is that they've moved to quasars and they have like something like 1.5 million quasars. Um, yeah, so, and to bear in mind here is that, yeah, this is coming from a satellite experiment. There's some slight, you know, compared to the radio galaxies, you have different systematics. Um, of course, the methodology is the same. So if you want to attack these results, you can attack them on methodology. There's some assumptions going into the methodology, but Subir at all are claiming 4.9 sigma. Now, I was reminded by somebody at Cassie two days ago that, you know, basically 4.9 sigma, you know, may not be a tension, but let me tell you 4.9 sigma is probably over three sigma. And, you know, even if we give them some benefit of that, this, this is, is sizable. And my understanding from talking to Roya is that some very senior people in cosmology are taking this very seriously. And let me point out that Ruth Durer also wrote a paper last week on this. Um, and the question she was asking, is this due to a large anisotropy in the universe or something else. Um, so let us move on. Okay, now this is to respond to some questions and answers and Sylvia's talk. Before we get into the data, right? Uh, so there's an Oxford group led by Subir Sarkar, and then there's a Sogan group, uh, sort of me, Lou, and Roy has some impurity in between. Um, but basically what's going on, as, as Sylvia pointed out, is that maybe the Oxford group are rushing to falsify dark energy. Um, you could say that they're testing the cosmological principle, but I mean, people have been doing, doing this forever, right? So, but they really seem to be going after dark energy. They typically work outside FLRW uh, conven and conventional frameworks. So when they analyze supernovae, they analyze it in a, you know, an unconventional manner. Um, and they really are in a rush to extrapolate results down to Z, essentially the local universe, right? Um, so at Sogon, we're doing something different. So uh, we're motivated by Hubble tension. So we see it, you know, okay, we've addressed what the limitations are within FLRW. And we think that this is a plausible way to go. Um, and our statements are exclusively at high Z. So we're not getting into fights with astronomers like Adam Reese or Brent Tully about whether or not they can determine H0 at low, well, the rate of expansion. Let me not call it H0. And uh, we're not going to get into fights with them. We'll let Subar do that fighting. Um, and, and we're going to analyze our data in the usual fashion, right? All we're gonna do is split it into hemispheres, but we're gonna work within FLRW models and in particular Lambda CDM. So our approach is basically very standard. Now, uh, now just, just getting back to Subir's result, which is basically a continuation of a decade of radio galaxies, uh, results on radio galaxies. Um, at, really at face value, it does suggest that our, you know, the, the cosmic dipole and the QSO dipole and its disagreement with the CMB really suggests that there's a blatantly large anisotropy that goes all the way out to Z equals one. And now it would be uh, impossible, to, impossible to hide this in, oh wait, five minutes, good, to hide this in our universe. So logically we have a binary choice. We have further data rejects this idea or further data supports this idea. Now, of course you can also stick your head in the sand and that's why I'm going to basically put the cosmic dipole under your nose at every single opportunity I have, just to avoid that we don't, you know, stick our head in the sand. Okay, so 
one thing that really excited me when we were wrapping up our project with Roya was that uh, there are some results due to the Holly Cow, actually due to TD Cosmo. So it's Holly Cow plus uh, DES. And what they have shown is that they're, uh, so, so these are H0 values inferred from strongly uh, lensed quasars, that basically there's a, a correlation between the H0 inferred and the redshift of the lens. Now, we were very interested in this. We've worked on it for since last year. It's even motivated some of Shaheen's talk or the paper that led to Shaheen's talk. But when, in our, when we were wrapping up our project, we decided basically just to plot these against the CMB dipole. And what you find is basically the highest H0 values are aligned with the CMB dipole. So this is consistent then with some anisotropy that's in that particular direction here. So uh, it's a very small data set. It's just suggestive, it's intriguing. But I was going to write the paper. I was sure this has to be the right idea. I'm just going to take it and run it. And I would have written any papers just based on that and taken a bet. So is it worth a punt? Yes, certainly it is. Um, okay, but if that's true, and this is like something at high Z because the quasars are at high Z, the lenses are also at relatively high Z. They're not below Z because 0.1. You should see things in other observables at high Z. And an obvious place to look is supernovae. And when we, you know, basically this, this analysis maybe a week or two, all I did, or we did, was basically just you know identify some region that's aligned with the CMB dipole. It was completely ad hoc, and uh, split split up the supernovae, and, and then basically fitted the lambda CDM model, right? And so what you find is that basically at low Z, so basically I imposed some minimum cutoff on redshift. So basically I'm going out in shells, throwing away the supernovae inside, and, and just slowly going out to higher and higher Z. And what you find is that there's a, a divergence in H0, right? So basically um, aligned with the CMB dipole, H0 goes up and, and this is slightly going down. This discrepancy is over two sigma. So what we did is we zoomed in on say Z min equals 0 0.55, which is essentially here. And then we ran like 5,000 or 6,000, maybe even 10,000 simulations of the data. So realizations of the data. And we realized that you would find that roughly you know, one time out of a hundred. So this is essentially almost 2.5 sigma here. And since then we were asked about biasing by various people in the H0 tension community. We went back and basically scanned over all the values. So instead of just basically ad hoc picking a direction, I scanned over RA and DEC. And what you can see here is basically, oh, these are sigmas I should say. So, you know, sigma, the H0 aligned is higher by one sigma, two sigma, and in the opposite direction, it's, you know, it's negative. Um, so basically what you can see clearly is there's a dipole here. And let me, let me skip on to this as well. Um, so now, now that you could worry that basically there's not many supernovae up here. It's roughly about 200 beyond 0.5. So it becomes quite sparse. But then we can switch over to something like uh, Rysalides and Luso's quasars. Um, so they've been trying to use quasars as standard candles. And, and there is this empirical relation in their luminosity between like X-ray and UV. And there's two parameters, beta and gamma. And, and, and and, and you can go from the luminosities to the fluxes, and, and this brings in the luminosity distance. So it's it's pretty standard, right? And, and what you can do is like they they I mean they have quasars. Let's see, the recent sample is over 2,000, 2,500 quasars, roughly between 0 .7, 0 0.7 and 1.7. You have a thousand quasars. So I just picked this because I think, like although gamma seems robust and it doesn't evolve with redshift. Beta seems to so show some rep evolution, but if you look at their paper from 2015, this one here, they'll essentially claim that in this more or less this redshift range, that basically beta doesn't evolve. So basically you can now go and you can look at the same, you can do the same exercise again and we find exactly the same thing, right? So basically there seems to be a preferred direction. Now here, this is not sigma, this is basically delta beta that I'm showing you. I fixed H0. Now basically this is one over, DL is one over H0 but gamma is uh, less than one. So it's roughly 0.6. So what you find is that an increase in beta is actually, you can interpret that as increase in, in H0. So again, we're seeing the same thing. And, and this, you know, the darkest spot down here, again, I mean, sky coverage is different. I had 200 supernovae in the same red shift range. I've got a thousand quasars here. Um, so it's not surprising that maybe there's some discrepancy in uh, the direction, but but basically this is over two point, this is essentially a 2.5 sigma difference in H0 between one hemisphere and another hemisphere. Um, so yeah, and you can check this using MCMC. So this result is not in the literature, but it will be in the literature soon. 
uh, along with a whole lot of plots that basically show this. Um, you, you show what's going on at different redshifts. Okay, so what's the take home? I have presented a number of very interesting coincidences. So basically, okay, we've got this lensed quasars, which seem to be aligned with the CMB dipole, a very small sample, seven, two of which are high and seem to be right on the CMB dipole. I think that can be, if, you know, if they're going to analyze like 40 lens systems going forward, they're in a rush to determine H0. I'm talking about TD Cosmo here. It's plausible that they will find this correlation and, and, and it will be substantiated that way. But on top of that, you can look at other observables. So you can look at supernovae, right? So we have a two sigma result, maybe just over two sigma in supernovae. And then we have like two sigma plus in uh, quasars as well. And again, they're using, I mean, okay, the, okay, the principle behind the, the standard candle, if you like, is, is different. These are different systematics, different experiments. None of this data is our data. I mean, we didn't construct it. Um, you know, basically the only thing you can question us on is the data analysis, but I think this is quite promising. So basically what the community have to do, cosmology community, is not do this, right? This is what not sh should not happen. But they should go home and they should split their data sets, take off the FLRW glasses, split the data sets, and into hemispheres and just reanalyze. And you can do it all within FLRW. You can do it within Lambda CDM. Then we're looking for discrepancies, which is just what I've been doing. This large anisotropy idea is extremely interesting, but far from subtle, right? So if it's, you know, if it's real, we should find it very quickly. We should be able to confirm this very quickly. If it's real, it rewrites cosmology. 99.9% .9 of cosmology is going out the window and everything's in flux again. And, and in principle, you're looking, at, you're stepping towards a resolution of Hubble tension, right? If the idea is wrong, it can quickly be challenged by independent data sets and thus bringing us back to FLRW. And then we're gonna to have to work very hard to solve Hubble tension, but it, it looks like it's gonna be some early universe physics. Thing. And I am open to this idea as well. Okay, let me, on that, let me finish and take questions. Okay, thank you. So uh, we have one or two, uh, two minutes of the Q&A and uh, Dr. Jia Junjiang will also give the word question. So how confident can we trust the quasars? What kinds of new data would you think of can provide significant new evidence? Well, so I think that's up to the community, right? So I think the quasars are trustable in a certain redshift range. I think beta doesn't evolve. Like, so basically, if you look at the quasars of Rizalitni and Luso, there's a whole load of discussion about, you know, beyond... Uh, beyond like say redshift 1.7 or so that that basically you're seeing non-lambda cdm type behavior right and and so there's a nice paper by ratra from uh, basically december last year and you can have a look at that he analyzes the data set across different models and more or less comes to that conclusion up to 1.5 or 1.7 it should be fine it seems to follow you know the distance moduli for the quasars seems to follow the distance, you know, they could be consistent with the distance moduli from supernovae, but beyond that, you know, all bets are off. Also, Dr. Stefano Skopel would uh, raise a hand, so I will let him talk. Dr. Stefano Skopel, could you uh, ask the question? So actually, I, 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 I pressed by mistake, but uh, since I met it, uh, um, uh, so uh, you say that it should be very clear, very, very uh, kind of dramatic effect. Yep, it's a very large anisotropy that so you know if it, you interpret it. Okay, I mean, so you say split the analysis in different hemisphere, but it has not been done in the past. Nobody has done that. Well, so basically, the CMB people subtract their dipole from the beginning. So Planck, I think, when they release, you know, basically, it's a very the dipole is a very large signal, and then you're looking for things that are orders of yeah, magnitude yeah. You lower in from the very beginning. So, so that has to come out and WMAP do it as well. And the BAO people also basically work within FLRW, right? So everybody's, I, I'm not saying, all I'm saying is we can still work within Lambda CDM, but we should keep an eye on orientation. No, the point is that you say that there should be a very dramatic effect there and nobody has seen this in the last 20 years. So that, that's why I'm, I'm just wondering. No, no, nobody's gone looking for it. Nobody's that crazy. Yeah, but if something is dramatic, you don't need. You don't need. Two beers crazy. Two beers crazy. <laughs> <laughs> don't need to look for it. You just uh, it is stand up. You stand out. Uh. No, no, I, I think people have gone looking for it in supernovae in Pantheon. So I don't know. If I stopped sharing. But basically, what they do is typically they use the whole data set, and, and so then the problem is at low Z astronomers you, uh, believe okay. they can correct supernovae. You from dilute computers. the effect. You dilute the effect. Exactly. So 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 astronomers are always working to basically extract H0 from an FLRW. 
-hmm. and they correct for all sorts of peculiar velocities. So I, I think this is basically why we're seeing something at high Z. But I mean, Subir is basically extrapolating from Z beyond one all the way down to Z equals 0 0.1. And, and from the analysis I've seen, I don't think any of it is very robust. And I think it's premature to make any statement in that direction. Okay, so thank you. So time is up. So uh, the, we would like to go to the next speaker. So if you have more Q&A to the Owen, then well, you can use the Q&A uh, chat room. So uh, let's go to the, next, the final speaker. So the final speaker is Dr. Mohamed Bagher Jahani Postek. And here we talk about the gravitational lensing by slowly accelerating black holes. Uh, Mohamed, what could you start sharing? Yeah. Yes. And Mohamed, you're muted. Mohamed, you're muted yet? So. Yes, okay. You got my voice now. Yeah, I can hear your voice now. Okay, okay, so so good. Yeah, All could right. you start? Yeah. Okay, my, my talk is on, um, my talk is on uh, phenomenological implications of uh, accelerating black holes, and in particular, uh, the gravitational lensing by these black holes, which me and uh, Amjad Ashu, you know, are currently studying. Well, some gauge theories allow the possibility of um, uh, topological defects such as cosmic string or domain walls. Uh, consider cosmic string, for example. We have recently shown that they can be, they, they can break to produce pair of black holes. These black holes would accelerate due to the tension of the string. On the other hand, you might have primordial black holes uh, in, in, in the early universe in there. A radiation error probably. Uh, these black, black holes can get attached to cosmic strings too, and they will too be accelerating the tension of the cosmic strings. Anyway, these, these black holes connected to cosmic strings could evolve to supermassive black holes. However, uh, if they are, if these supermassive black holes are going to play a role in the structure formation, their velocity should be limited. Therefore, the, the acceleration should be limited. We assume that the acceleration of the black hole is so small that a ray of light which is coming from a source behind the black hole, is passing the black hole and is coming to us, stay on the, stay on or nearly on the equator of the black hole in the whole way. One may ask if such a small acceleration could be observed. Well, our answer will be positive. Uh, of course, if the black hole is on in, in a flat background, no magnetic field, then the <clears throat> accelerating black hole will be described by symmetry. And there are many different forms to represent the symmetry, one of them which has been recently of interest in uh, phenomenological in studies. Uh, has been presented by Griffiths and collaborators in this form here. Q uh, is the metric function along with P, uh, but just uh, remember Q here. And <clears throat> uh, alpha has been interpreted as the acceleration of the black hole. Uh, uh, and this metric has a well-defined alpha to zero limit, which reduces to sure shield metric in that limit. And here, consider a lensing effect like this, depicted in this figure. 
uh, in this figure we see that uh, a, a light is coming from a source and is passing the black hole deflected by an angle alpha hat near the black hole uh, and continue its way to the observer. The observer will see the will see an image of the uh, source uh, at I, which is the uh, the in image point, and uh, on the same side uh, of the black hole with, with respect to the source itself. And this one is called the primary image, which is on the same side as the source itself. There are also in an image uh, for which the light goes this way. I'm sorry. Um, uh, here. Uh, going this way um, below the black hole here in this picture and uh, it turned to the observer and observer will see the, an image of that one here, around here. Uh, I, I, I just uh, missed that here in the figure and you, 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 the observer will see it here on this, on this plane uh, and that one, which is on the opposite side of the black hole, is called the secondary image. There are also other images for which the light ray will rotate around the black hole before reaching the observer. Uh, those are called relativistic images. And also, uh, I, I should note that uh, the distance from the source to the black hole and the distance from the observer to the black hole is large compared to the distance of the closest approach uh, of the ray of light to the black hole and associated to an accelerating black hole. This, this black hole is actually is uncharged, non-rotating, but is accelerating in a direction perpendicular to the, the plane of this figure. So uh, this black hole is a, accelerating, but the acceleration is very small that the, uh, the, the, the ray is stayed near or on the, on the plane of the equatorial plane in a whole way from the source to the observer. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I was saying that there is an acceleration horizon associated to the, the accelerating black hole. The, the, the smaller the acceleration, the farther away, the farther the, uh, the acceleration horizon. So we take the acceleration horizon uh, in a distance larger than the distance from the source to the light. Okay. Now, uh, the, the, the motion of the particles around the black hole are governed by this Lagrangian here dot represent a, a differentiation with respect to a fine parameter. And uh, the, on equatorial plane, we, we have theta dot equals zero, and we can find this uh, constant of motions. Uh, at the closest approach, differentiations of R vanish, and we can find the, uh, the, the, the deflection angle by this integral here. And the deflection angle decreased by increasing the impact parameter or the closest approach parameter. And this result is insensitive to whether the black hole is non-accelerating or slowly accelerating. This result is insensitive. So this is true for, for uh, for, for accelerating and for non-accelerating black holes. Both of them decrease, and this is the same figure for both of them. Actually, it, I, I have been for, I have a lot of for accelerating black holes, but uh, there's no, no difference, there's no, no, no significant difference between them for the, the, the accelerating or non-accelerating, in this case, for the alpha hat. And so, because the acceleration is taken to be so small here, and I took the mass of the black hole as the mass of the, the black hole at the center of M87 galaxy. 
And there is also another parameter, the time delay, uh, which is uh, the difference between the time it takes for the light to travel from the source to the observer in a space time, in physical space time, uh, which the, uh, in which the black hole is present and in a space time where in which the black hole is not present and uh, in, a, in a flat background. So uh, this parameter, the time delay is obtained by this integral here. You have five more minutes. Okay. The, the image position are obtained by this lens equation. Here D is the, is the uh, is this ratio, the distance from the source to the black hole over the distance from the source to the observer. And since we have taken the black hole halfway between the observer and the source, then this ratio is half. Also, uh, this uh, parameter, the magnitude, which shows how difficult it is to observe an image. So, in this table, we have uh, presented the, the, the images position and magnification of primary and secondary images. And the, the, the magnification is not defined for the case in which the source is exactly behind the black hole. In that case, we would have Einstein thing. And considering the, the primary image, we, we see that the uh, primary image position uh, increased by increasing the angular position of the source data. Here you can see the result, the, the same result here in these plots here, the, the separation between the angular position of the primary image, the red line, and the uh, secondary image, the blue line, increased by increasing the angular position of the source. And this result is insensitive to whether the black hole is non-accelerating or slowly accelerating. Here we present the uh, results for time delay uh, of the primary image uh, um, for the case of non-accelerating, accelerating black holes in the second column and the non-accelerating case in the uh, fourth column. You see that even for this small value of acceleration, uh, the, the time delay increased by six orders of magnitude, which is very interesting. But the time delay itself is not unobservable. What is observable is the differential time delay, which is the difference between the time delay of primary image and the secondary image. Suppose that the, 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 the source is and pulsating a shot. Every phase in this period will be observed in the secondary image TD seconds after it appears in the uh, primary image. TD is the differential time delay here. And in the last column, we see the difference between the differential, column, the differential time delay of the uh, prime uh, of, of the non-accelerating case and accelerating case, we see that the, in the accelerating case, the, uh, uh, the, the differential time delay is uh, lower than the results for the non-accelerating case. I note that, again, I note that the image position do not change if the black hole is not accelerating or slowly accelerating, do not change significantly. If the theory is something other than GR, then not only the differential time delay, but the, uh, the image position will change. But here, the image position stay the same. So we can conclude that. If, if, if in a future observation, the, op, uh, the image position matched the prediction of GR, a possible deviation in, in the differential time delay can be due to the acceleration uh, of the black hole. Okay, I guess my time is over. I can explain some things more or... Uh, 
for example, if here I should note that we we, we don't uh, actually we, we we can't find the uh, the beta directly from an observation. What we see is just two images, and if the source is pulsating, we can also find the uh, the the differential time delay. So how could we find out how, how beta is? Well, we find two images. A, a vertical line here, the uh, cross these lines in two points. And that the difference between the, the, the time delay, the, 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 the image position of the source and the, of the, of, of the uh, primary image and the secondary image uh, will give us the, the, the beta here. If you just draw a vertical line here, then we can use this beta to uh, find how the prediction of the GR is for the, case, for the uh, time delay in the case of non-accelerating case of accelerating case. Then we just observe actually compare or prediction, GR prediction with, the, with what we have observed, then we say if the black hole is up, uh, accelerating or not. Okay, so uh, thank you for your talk. And we have two or three minutes for Q&A. So if you have questions, then please well, leave your questions to the, the Q&A chat or raise your hand. If no, then uh, let's thank the, all of the speakers for this section, session. And uh, I would like to uh, close but this cosmology session right now. So thank you for listening and thank you for participating. Thank you.